Connor Ben got things going with a quick knockout over Chris Van Heerden. Uh, Van Heerden is 34 years old and has been off for a year and a half, but uh, I thought it was still an impressive win for Ben. Uh, his father, Nigel, was probably my uh, favorite British boxer of all time. Uh, Connor looks to be cut from the same cloth. Uh, he has the same seek and destroy mindset that his father had. Uh, I think maybe his father had smoother head movements, but uh, Connor has better legs. And maybe he's even developing a greater repertoire of punches. Uh, he's been in the game for six years now, and he has improved by leaps and bounds. You know, I didn't think he had much of a future in the sport when I saw him in his uh, first few bouts, but uh, man, this guy has upped his game to the point where I would make him even money against a lot of the top guys in the welterweight division right now. You know, Ben is fast, strong, and smart. Uh, he solved Van Heerden's softball style really quickly, you know, setting him up with jabs and some hooks before shooting in with a straight right cross to uh, end matters in the second round. I know he has his critics, and they're going to say that he hasn't fought anyone, but uh, what is more notable to me is the way he's beaten his last two opponents in uh, Chris Algieri and now uh, Chris Van Heerden, uh, you know, just showing total domination of uh, some older but still well-schooled fighters. Now, there's talk of him facing uh, Kel Brook, who has priced himself out, and or possibly taking on Adrian Broner. You know, both of these fighters, uh, both Broner and uh, Brooke are pretty shopworn at this point in their careers, but I suppose uh, his promo Ben's promoter wants to pad his resume before uh, he tackles the big boys in the welterweight division, which is just super stacked right now. Now, the Spence Ugas fight was a lot more one sided than I expected. Uh, Spence has had long stretches of inactivity, so I thought maybe Ugas could get the jump on him as uh, Spence shedded that ring rust. But I thought ultimately that Spence would take a decision. I always thought of Ugas as a dark horse in the division because uh, his fight with Sean Porter was a toss-up. You know, I thought the judges didn't see things his way because of Ugas' uh, lack of name value. And he really wasn't given credit for his victory over Manny Pacquiao because of the Pac-Man's age. You know, Ugas is a fighter that always stands his ground. And uh, that style was effective against Porter and Pacquiao. But it backfired against Spence, as uh, he didn't know how to use any lateral movement effectively after he was injured and uh, early on when it was just clear that he was not the stronger man. So I had Spence winning every round until the 6th when he lost his mouthpiece and uh, Ugas was able to land some flush shots. Uh, in the 7th round, uh, whatever rust Spence had uh, was removed. I don't even think he had any. And he smothered Ugas with a powerful 1-2s, uh, breaking his orbital bone and eventually scoring a 10th round stoppage. So Ugas is the latest addition to uh, fighters who've suffered broken eye sockets while taking on Spence. Uh, Van Heerden and Kel Brook also suffered the same injury fighting Spence. Spence also broke uh, Alejandro Barrera's jaw, so his power is more than just concussive. His punches crack bones. So the wait is on for everyone's dream fight to be made against Chance Crawford, uh, which now seems doable since uh, Crawford is no longer with top rank. Uh, maybe 2022 is finally the year where we'll see this uh, much-anticipated showdown. Now, the undercard of Spence Ugas was not a showcase of up-and-coming fighters uh, so much as it was a, about fighters who need to retire. Francisco Vargas was starched in one round by Jose Valenzuela. Uh, Vargas is 37 years old and is nowhere near the fighter he was back in 2015. Jose Cito Lopez lost a lopsided decision to the undefeated Cody Crowley. Uh, Lopez had been off for close to a year and a half. He looked really soft around the middle. Uh, Lopez was obviously brought in as an opponent, which uh, he has been throughout his career, but he no longer has the ability to pull off the upset as he once did. You know, granted, some of these guys have had these long layoffs because of COVID, uh, but because of their uh, advanced age, no, they need to take a tune-up at least before they enter into a televised contest. But the biggest example of a fighter who absolutely needs to retire is Yuri Orcas Gamboa, who was bounced up and down the canvas like a canceled check against Isak Cruz. Uh, Gamboa is long past his prime. Uh, this guy has not been the same fighter since he was stopped by Terence Crawford, and that was way back in 2014. 
And frankly, even before then, uh, Gamboa has always been overrated. Uh, he never developed any semblance of defense, and he got by on reflexes against inferior opposition. So now he no longer has any reflexes, and he's still somewhat of a name. And he's really lucky he did not get seriously injured, because the Cruz was just letting loose with some hellacious power shots, and he couldn't miss. So Gamboa should obviously not be allowed in the ring anymore. And there has to be some integrity on the part of the promoters and managers. But, uh, you know, we all know that's like howling at the moon. In this segment, I'm going to show some footage of Curtis Parker that didn't quite make it into his documentary piece. Uh, this bout is from May of 1983. Parker is three fights removed from his decision loss to Mustafa Hampshire in their rematch. He's ranked just outside the top 10 at this point in his career. Meanwhile, his opponent, Kenny Bristol, was a junior middleweight born in Guyana, but fought out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he won a New York Golden Gloves title in 1976. He became the first Guyanese to win the Commonwealth uh, belt. Uh, he was a fringe junior middleweight contender by this point, uh, losing his Commonwealth belt to Harold Graham about a year and a half earlier. So this is from 1983, uh, highlights of Curtis Parker taking on Kenny Bristol in a crossroads bout. 18 of those 22 wins have come via the knockout route. And look at this, the left-hander has come out as an orthodox fighter, as a right-hander. Parker has come out slugging. That's the only way he knows. I don't think Curtis has had too many easy nights in this ring. Huh. When you stand five foot eight and you're a middleweight contender, you gotta fight the best in the world, the Mustafa Ham shows, Dwight Davison, Wilfred Sipions. They're gonna be in a war every time out. And what a war we had a couple of months back, March 14th to be exact, when Parker scored a win over a real rugged at that time, Tony Braxton. Great fight here on Frisbee. Parker doing what he has to do, but you just noticed as he came diving in, he took a left hand on the nose. Curtis Parker, 5'8", Kenny Bristol, six feet, one inch tall. Come on, Curtis. And that's not the whole of the story. Curtis Parker has a reach of 25 inches, Kenny Bristol 33. Bristol owns an eight inch reach advantage. I've never seen one that, that large. Eight inches, Kenny Bristol outreaches his man. He, he can hit him across the ring. Parker will be, for the most part, looking right smack into the chest of his opponent. Look where Bristol is throwing the jab from all the way out there. Parker can't even get close. So what Curtis has to do is not stand there and bob and weave. He's got to get closer and move those hands. Above us, Parker trying to dig in with some body shots. Now goes to the head and lands a couple. Now Parker lands about three or four good strong blows in there. Bristol, the one thing he can't do, Randy, is what he's doing right now. That's not his fight. Parker just going to work. This is what Parker wants. He wants to make a brawl out of it. He knows, Parker knows, and he can take his best shot, beating Bristol's. And Bristol can ill afford to exchange blows. It's got to be so frustrating to be such a fine boxer and own no power. Curtis Parker, before the fight, asked me, does this guy have any power? I see he's got one knockout. I said, listen, I'm not going to tell you he's got no power. And then you get knocked around. Blood coming from the right ear of Kenny Bristol. And you see blood on the forehead of Curtis Parker. Now, I believe that may have been caused by leaning against the ear of Bristol. Let's look at it closer. Parker again, going to work. Has Bristol against the ropes and digs a couple of shots into the body. The opening round, final seconds. But there is blood on the forehead above the left eye of Curtis Parker. Frazier, the big guy with not much power in green. Kenny Bristol, Ali, the little guy with lots of power, very aggressive, shorter. Curtis Parker, Frazier. An excellent analogy, the facial resemblance. Uh -huh very much there as well. Sweeping Joe Frazier left hooks. And now Ali back on the ropes. Just a place he doesn't want to be. He's fighting Curtis Parker's fight. Parker now just leaning on his taller, ganglier opponent. And starting to land 
lefts and rights in fast order. For those who wonder, Kenny Bristol has never been stopped before. Nobody has done that. He's lost some pretty close decisions. Nobody has stopped him, cuts or otherwise. Bristol just got out of the way of a wild right there, but he is getting hit with these short lefts and rights in close. Away from the ropes, Curtis grabbed him with his left hand and said, no, you're staying right here. Parker just hammering away the only way he knows. Take two to land one any time. Bristol trying to weather every flurry, and that's it for round two. An extra punch at the bell by Curtis Parker. But a tough night with a cut on his left or left eye and also right ear. That right uppercut by Bristol was blocked by Parker. Once again, Kenny Bristol in a spot he doesn't belong. He's got good ring movement, side-to-side -side movement, a longer reach, and for some reason he's staying on the rope. One thing about Parker's cut, his style will not let that cut get well. He puts that head right in there and leaves himself vulnerable to all kinds of short jabs. That is not just a scratch on the head. They just were above the both of us, and the blood is leaking out of that cut. Ooh. So Milton Pop Bailey, who worked with Joe Frazier, has his work in front of him. He knows what he's got to do, and it's plenty. Bristol started out with green trunks with gold trim. It's now green trunks with red gold trim. After missing, Bristol tries to take advantage. They're on top of us now. There's a good short right hand that caught Bristol. When that bell rings, Curtis Parker's in there to fight 180 seconds. We're in the third round right now, and it's been like this since the opening bell. Cuts and all. 60 seconds left in that third round. I think one of the greatest fights that could be made today in boxing is Curtis Parker against Frank the Animal Fletcher. Wow. We've talked about it. There's a right hand by Parker and a left, and that's stunned Kenny Bristol. He didn't want to mix it up after that exchange. Left and right by Parker again, and Bristol, who's never been knocked out, is in trouble. Look at those shots he's taking. He's still on his feet. He's taking the best that Parker can throw now. 30 seconds remaining. We're in the third round and Kenny Bristol wants to go at it again. I don't think Kenny Bristol knows a six-letter word called clinch. Boy, Parker just banging away. Bristol open. Hands down, open for the lefts and rights. In Parker's corner now. Closing seconds of another grueling, bruising round, and Parker getting much the better of it now. All oh, those body shots. There it is, third round, and wow, was that a tough one. Get off him, get off him. A gamer for sure is break, Kenny break, Bristol. Break, break, break. Step back, come on. Oh, those body shots some more. Relentless is Curtis Park. And Curtis has gone southpaw, something I've never seen him do. More of the same here in round four. See, Jim, at this point, Curtis Parker is showing Bristol no respect. He knows the man can't punch. He doesn't care that he can box. He's not getting hurt by those shots. So he says, hey, I'm standing right in here and banging with him. Technically, you can see why Bristol has no power. He's back on his heels when he punches. Very little leverage at all, and he throws real short, choppy blows. There's the mouthpiece knocked away from Kenny Bristol. Bristol above us, taking some shots again. That mouthpiece went into the first row of spectators here. One man was nice enough to throw it back into Bristol's corner. Bristol remains on the ropes. 
getting pounded. Parker is grunting a la Joe Frazier. Remember, he trains in the Frazier gym. He's picked up some of those Frazier habits. Every shot, he's Parker down inside himself, pulling out those grunts and groans, all the effort he can. Nothing ever comes easy for Curtis Parker, including this fight. He's having his own way up there, but it's a tough night nonetheless. If you think it's tough for him, ask Kenny Bristol how he feels. Bristol without his mouthpiece for quite a spell here in round four. Oh, a hard right by Parker. So dangerous if you don't have your mouthpiece in your mouth. It has nothing to do with the teeth, preserving the teeth. What happens if you have your mouth open a little bit and you get hit with an uppercut, you can actually bite a hole right in your tongue. Ten seconds remaining here in the fourth round. There's the bell. Parker again with one extra in the round. That's a couple of times he's done that. We're going to have some medical attention here in the corner of Kenny Bristol for sure. He has been cut more than just over the left eye. It's very difficult to now to even pinpoint the cuts. Let's see what Rudy Battle decides. Rudy Battle says this fight's over. Rudy Battle went in along with rink physician Frank Doggett. Looked over the battered face of Kenny Bristol and called this one to a halt. So this week I should have a Fighting Harada uh, documentary piece up soon. And if you have any questions on the sweet science, you know, fantasy fights, future fights, opinions on fighters, uh, please write them below. And I'll include them on next week's broadcast of the Monday Morning Corner Man. Uh, thanks again for tuning in.